Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast. How do you know you haven't already been breached? So let me go ahead and introduce our presenters. First, we have Jim Morio, Principal with Cornerstone IT, a strategic partner of NetSureans. Our second presenter is Guy Cunningham, who is the Senior VP of Channel and Alliances with NetSurian. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim. Take it away, sir. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thanks you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'll go over the agenda real quick, Could do one or two or three slides uh, on the Cornerstone side, and then hand it over to Guy, who will uh, probably do, do the bulk of the presentation, and then I'll pick it up towards the end. I don't think Guy's video camera is working, so, uh, um, but he does have a better, much better profile shot uh, than mine, so I'm a little jealous to try and get one of those as well. Um, so the agenda uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Cornerstone's managed services and, and how it uh, aligns with Netsurian's uh, security services. Uh, then Guy's going to get into some of the cybersecurity challenges, um, talk a bit about the NIST and uh, CSF framework, and then get into really the reason why we're here is, is you know, how do you know if someone's on your network? So uh, Guy, I'll get into uh, the, the threat, uh, the, the threat protection and, and event tracker enterprise, and then uh, that'll, I'll kind of wrap it up towards the end as, as we have um, to how we complement each other's services, and we'll do some Q and A. As Dave said, uh, uh, please feel free to ask any questions, chime in, whether it's in the chat or uh, in the questions um, uh, area in the uh, in the go to webinar. Um, so talk a little bit about, let me just make sure my slide deck works here. Talk a little bit about, I went too far, um, about Cornerstone's services. Um, so we, Cornerstone's managed services, well, we do project services as well, but our managed services include uh, 24 by seven monitoring. So we monitor our clients' networks, everything from servers to SANs to infrastructure, um, to services to make sure that they're up and running uh, uh, 24 hours a day, and we also troubleshoot when they go offline, whether it's an internet circuit or otherwise. Uh, we do regular patching, so we keep our, our clients' networks patched, whether it's a Windows patch or a Cisco patch or VMware or Citrix Netscalers, uh, or some of the patches that came out, the zero-day exchange patches that came out uh, in March and in April, um, we roll those out. We do vulnerability remediation, so a lot of our clients get um, third party that does penetration testing, uh, we remediate those vulnerabilities that uh, that show up in uh, through those uh, penetration tests. We also do vulner monthly vulnerability scans for our clients uh, to validate that we've installed the patches and then also to find uh, configurations that need to be modified. Uh, and then as a follow-up to that, we, uh, we do our uh, reporting and health checks for our clients, and then we provide ongoing support services. Uh, so that's more or less what we do as, as our managed services, and then we complement that uh, work with uh, with Netsurian's security services. Uh, there were some awards at the bottom of that that our marketing person is very proud of, uh, but I'll hand it over to Guy, and then I'll chime in uh, uh, as needed. So Guy Cunningham, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, you, sir. Appreciate it, Jim, and I think it's, uh... To everybody's benefit that my, my webcam doesn't work, you don't have to stare at me. <laughs> so, you know, from NetSurian's perspective, we really enjoy working with Cornerstone. Um, they're one of our, our up-and-coming partners, and they really get this cybersecurity landscape. And, you know, if, as I try and think about cybersecurity from um, our customer's perspective, uh, it's it's pretty difficult, and, and there are three major challenges that we tend to hear customers articulate. And the first is that they there's no single solution that does anything. There's there's thousands of cybersecurity vendors, um, so the, the 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 capabilities that you need to implement across your entire network are very fragmented, and so it's hard to to know what combination of solutions and technologies to pick and which, which particular vendors um, you should be working with. The second major challenge is that 
it's constantly in flux. I mean, it's not a static industry. Uh, there is a huge financial motivation for the hackers to stay uh, constantly changing, uh, to always be finding new ways around protection. And that means that the cybersecurity vendors have to adapt as well. Um, some technology vendors keep up with the changes and some uh, technologies tend to, to kind of get long in the tooth. And so that adds to that fragmentation and the confusion. And then the, the third major issue is that, candidly, it's, it's kind of hard to find cybersecurity talent now. There, there's actually a negative unemployment rate. So think about what that means. It means that there are more positions in the marketplace than there are people to fill them. And so for any company that hires a cybersecurity expert, they're likely to get recruited away um, in, in fairly short order. So it, it just becomes a, a kind of a revolving door. Um, and the cost of those, those people, those experts, is continually rising due to the shortage. And so we try and address those issues and those challenges with the event tracker uh, solution uh, and, and partner with companies like, like Cornerstone to, to, to get the solution deployed into the customer base. So we've got a poll question. We're going to try and make this interactive uh, as much as possible. Um, and so the first question is, whoop, went too far, just revealed the answer to you. So hopefully everybody was paying attention and you get the answer right now. <laughs> but David's gonna launch the poll here. So the, what is the average length of time that it takes to identify a successful cyber breach? So what that means is somebody's in your network, they're snooping around, they're doing bad things, or they're getting ready to do bad things, and you don't know about it. But how long does it take for the average customer, the average company to figure out that they've been breached? I can tell you that I've been in this industry for nearly 20 years. The length of time it takes to identify a cyber breach is going down. You know, five years ago, it was probably uh, a third longer than it is today. Um, but I would imagine that it would still shock you. So, David, how are we doing? Uh, we're doing well. We've got about 60% who have voted already. So, if you guys want to get in and get your answer in. Um, those of you who are paying attention know it. Some of you clearly were not. So uh, yeah, they're coming in now. I'm gonna close it here in about 10 seconds. All right. They're coming fast, they're coming furious, and some people are gonna start paying attention now because they missed the answer. All right, closing it now. Uh, here we go. I will launch the results in just a second. All right. All right. There you go. So 62% of the respondents said it takes 207 days on average to find a breach and another 38% had the wrong answer. It's 207 Jeez. days. So that's over a half a year, right? So that's almost seven months on average it takes. And, and think about what a, a hacker can do in seven months. Right. If if they're snooping around, if they're putting their their landmines in place, they're they're scoping your systems out, they're understanding your network, um, they're identifying and codifying the data that you have on your network, and they're sucking it out little by little. Um, you know, there's a lot of damage that can be done. So if you want to to verify this statistic, you can go to the to the IBM website there where the where the results were were published. So that should scare people, right? That's the average time, right? There's a lot more that are that take a lot longer. So Dave, you wanna move it forward for us? There we go, all right. Jim, I'm gonna turn this back over to you to talk about the NIST cybersecurity framework. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, this is the, uh, a lot of folks have seen this, uh, this framework before, it talks about um, the, the Pentagon, the recovery, Sorry, the identify, the protect, detect, respond, recovery, um, five bullets. And, and uh, I won't read through all of these. I think the next slide really kind of talks to Cornerstone services. But anytime you see a proposal from a cybersecurity vendor, they should be aligning um, 
their services to the to this framework to identify what you have on your network to protect that to detect it to see if someone's on your network uh, or there's some malware going on to respond to that and then to do the remediation that's required to get you back to normal so when we hit on the next yeah, before yeah. you move that um, I would say that most small businesses and even medium and mid-market businesses today probably don't have this detect and respond capability in place. What we've heard is that the help desk is kind of the de facto detect and response. An employee sends an email, says, hey, something's funny on my machine. Can you look into it? And that's how they, they figure it out. Do you find that that's the case in your customers? Yeah, certainly. We do a lot of work, obviously, in the legal industry. Um, the larger firms, uh, the you know two thousand person firms, they've they, they've get it, they've got it, they need to do it because they're customers. But sort of the small to mid size, and that's the under a thousand uh, uh, employee firms, are the ones that don't necessarily, or, or in many cases, don't have that detect uh, capability. They don't know that someone's already on the network. Yeah, they've got their anti malware software, and they've got their firewalls and they've got their patching in place, but they don't have the tools to really know that someone's been scanning, someone's running some some applications on a on a PC in one of their regional offices um, to snoop around their network. Uh, so no, guy, mo most small to mid-sized firms don't usually have that type of detection. Yeah, and it, frankly, it's probably because of cost. You know, historically, it's been really really costly, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. Right. Right. Yeah, Dave, you give me the next slide. Took a little bit about specifics about Cornerstone's uh, services. So uh, we leave sort of the security uh, hard work of uh, the um, detect and uh, um, protect, de detecting uh, to, uh, to our friends at Netsurian. But what Cornerstone does on the, identif uh, on the identify is similar to what I said on that first slide. We've got the network monitoring. We've got tools that do vulnerability scan, risk intelligence scans or something that uh, affects uh, personal information. So we'll find on someone's network whether they have passport information, licenses, credit cards, that type of scanning we'll do. We keep track of the firm's assets so we know if their support contract's gonna expire uh, and we put together technology roadmaps for where they need to go over the next couple of years. Uh, and then the protecting is the patching. We we offer specific services for firms uh, who may not have expertise in managing their document management system, like say iManage or Citrix or the Cisco infrastructure. Or now we're seeing more firms putting products up and uh, services up in Azure. So we sort of that augment some of our our clients' uh, staff with uh, specific technologies that they may not have. Like Guy said, there's a lot. A lot of cost in some of these engineers. Um, so some firms are having challenges retaining their iManage or Citrix or Cisco engineer. So we uh, sort of help pick up uh, uh, the work there. Uh, and then on the response side, um, uh, we get firms that uh, we get calls with some regularity, unfortunately, who've been breached and need some type of remediation. And we'll go in there and we'll help um, uh, clean up the mess, we'll say, and, and uh, remediate that. So it's more or less with Cornerstone Services, and then uh, it's complemented with NetSorians. Uh, um, so I'll give it back to you, Guy. All right. So <clears throat> as Jim was talking about, the cybersecurity framework that NIST puts out is it's a best practices guide, and it talks about those five areas that uh, you should at least be planning for, if not having already implemented solutions for. Um, in addition to the services that that Cornerstone does, um, there's there's also some technology that they're in place. You know, endpoint protection, email security, DNS, those kinds of things. Those are all part of the kind of the baseline cybersecurity um, infrastructure that you need to put in place. Um, but as we talked about previously, that detect and respond. How do you know if you haven't been breached? Um, and that means that there's monitoring involved, real time, 24 by seven monitoring. And, and typically the, the, the protective technologies, the preventative technologies don't do a great job of monitoring. They either do their job or they don't. They either stop something or they don't. And it's, and it's the cyber attacker's job 
to get around those protective or preventative technologies. That's how, that's how they make their money. Um, so they are always trying to find ways that they get around it and are stealthy and um, kind of fly under the radar. And so that's, that's where NetSurian comes in and really provides that 24 by seven monitoring and detection and response. You might've heard MDR, you might've heard, um, you know, SOC services, et cetera. And so what we've um, built into our platform is 24 by seven SOC, security information and event management platform, SIM platform. And in addition to the endpoint security that Cornerstone provides, our platform also has an endpoint detection and response capability for anything that might slip past that endpoint protection or the firewall. Um, and it leverages multiple dozens of threat intelligence feeds, a whole bunch of artificial intelligence machine learning. Um, and we can also monitor anomalous logins. So if somebody's breaking a typical pattern of login behavior, um, we also monitor the communications of the device uh, inside the network as well as who they're talking to outside the network. And then if we see something, we respond. Um, our security analysts prepare a remediation recommendation plan, communicate that with, with Cornerstone, and then Cornerstone takes on the, the responsibility of working with you to get into your network and, and fix the problem and, and prevent it from uh, going further. All right, poll question number two. David, I'm not gonna touch it. I'm not gonna push the slides. So um, I'm not gonna reveal the answer this time. All right, so here's the question. How many unique categories of cyber attack techniques have been identified? So if you're familiar with MITRE attack, um, MITRE is an organization, quasi-governmental organization that is basically in the research uh, business. And their job is to try and figure out how cyber criminals do what they do. And they have something called the MITRE attack framework. It stands for attackers, tactics, and techniques, and common knowledge. That's what attack stands for. And it's basically a, 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 an encyclopedia of the various tactics and techniques that cyber criminals use to get past cyber defensive technologies. And so the question here is how many different categories, not individual unique techniques, but just broad categories of tactics and techniques have been identified? So the, the, the votes are coming in, and without a cheat sheet, I, I'm going to give a little hint that not, uh, not everybody's getting this one right. So um, I'll give it about another 10 seconds. Get your votes in. We're almost at 100%. But, um, yeah, they really liked it when you gave them the answer beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, let's go that way. All right, we're closing the poll in three, two, and one. And here come the results. All right, 67% said 487. So the real answer, I'll let David shut this down, the real answer is 206. And that was as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, they continually find new tactics and techniques, so they're adding to that database. Uh, if you go to this website, attack.miner.org, you can see a matrix of all of those tactics and techniques. There's about 14 different major categories, and then each one of them has a subcategory underneath it. I, I would encourage you to take a look at that because I think you'll quickly identify that it's very hard as an individual person or even a team of people to do this manually, to try and trace an attacker's path through your network by identifying tactics and techniques. Um, what NetSurian's done is we've baked that matrix of tactics and techniques into our threat management platform. And then we've leveraged machine learning to be able to identify all of those things in real time. And then be able, and basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify pre-events, um, you know, pre pre-activities that are leading up to a breach. You know, maybe maybe they're in your network, but maybe they haven't stolen anything yet, or they haven't exfiltrated anything, or they haven't encrypted anything. Um, so we try and identify that activity as early as possible to prevent that from happening. This is actually a representation of how 
the event tracker security information and event management architecture works. Basically what we're looking for is all of the log data from all of the devices in your network. So that includes servers, it includes workstations, laptops, desktops, it includes firewalls, it includes any other types of log sources that would be generating security related information. And we collect all that information in real time, send it up to the event tracker console, all of our threat intelligence and artificial intelligence is applied against that log data to analyze and correlate the activity. And then our SOC is watching this 24 by seven. And if we see something that we consider to be uh, mission critical, you need to respond right away. We're in communication with Cornerstone within about 15 minutes. And then, you know, their team's jumping on it and uh, getting in your network and, and stopping the attack from, from getting further. And the benefit of that is that, uh, A, we're going to stop the attack. We're going to prevent, ideally, ransomware from being installed and encryption uh, of your data occurring, which then means you don't have to recover from backups. You don't have to have any downtime, et cetera. Uh, and obviously, there's the, the benefit of not losing any sensitive data. Um, as you look at uh, cybersecurity a little bit more broadly, we're fitting our managed threat protection platform inside of a cybersecurity maturity model. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got uh, predict, prevent, detect, and respond. And if you go back to the NIST cybersecurity framework, those match up with identify, protect, detect, and respond. And so what we're enabling Cornerstone to do um, is help move their customers through this cybersecurity maturity model from an operational level of IT cybersecurity where you're doing vulnerability scanning, antivirus, and then patching with a firewall, all the way over to the right side where you've got a SOC, you're integrating that security information with security orchestration automation platforms, um, having a 24 by 7 team of people watching that, and then uh, applying machine learning against against the, the information and then having a team of security analysts responding to the output of that. And there's a whole bunch of steps in between those two ends of the spectrum. But one of the things that I would encourage everybody on this call to do is to think about, OK, am I where am I in this maturity model and what do I need to do next in order to get to that next step? Because as we said, Cybersecurity is ever changing. The attackers are always mutating and coming up with new tactics and techniques. And it's our job as the defense team to always be responding to that and changing our, our tactics uh, from a defensive posture. All right, so back to the market challenges. Cybersecurity solutions are fragmented. What we've done is we've not come to market with a single technology, but we've really built a platform that combines a bunch of different technologies into a single pane of glass that we're watching in 24 by seven and, and Cornerstone's watching 24 by seven. So um, we've, we've made it easier to manage and taken the burden off of the end user um, and you know, managing that on behalf of the end user through the combination of Cornerstone and, and NetSuring. Um, we've addressed the constant state of flux by always adding in new capabilities and the platform is ever evolving. And our SOC is always feeding new feature and function requests into our development team. And so you as the customer of Cornerstone get the benefit of all this progressive development um, and stay on the cutting edge of cybersecurity. And then the last one, it's really the hardest one to address, I think, is that we've eliminated the need for end user customers to hire cybersecurity staff. And from Cornerstone's perspective, they don't have to hire as many cybersecurity staff. They can leverage our team through this partnership. Um, we handle the grunt work. We are looking at everything 24 by seven. We're feeding the actionable intelligence to Cornerstone and then through their expertise, they're going in and, and remediating and fixing and, and making sure that everything's working the way that it should work. Yeah, and I'll just add to that guy, and it, um, as 
the owner of Cornerstone, I did not want to have to go through the um, the expense and the challenges of building our own sock. And we do what we do very well. And uh, similar for lawyers and their firms, they should do what they do very well and not have to worry about trying to build their own security team when they could uh, um, sort of outsource or hire that. And that's that's more or less what Cornerstone did by partnering with Netsurian. We get the best of breed by using your your expertise, bundling with ours, and and that allowed us to deliver something to our clients that we couldn't build ourselves. That's the goal. All right. Um, so, poll question number three: How big is the average ransomware payment? This is average across small, medium, even large enterprise. Um, so we've heard about the, you know, the splashy ransomware payments, you know, millions of dollars, but, you know, it's, you think about a small business, you know, a couple hundred employees, um, their systems are shut down, their data is encrypted, their, their information is held at ransom. You know, what should you plan on having to pay if that is, is the situation? And one thing that I will say is that, um, there is a, a trend, or a, there's a tendency for companies that get um, infected by ransomware and who pay, they get attacked again. They're, they're identified as a vulnerable target um, because these cyber criminals know that even though they may have recovered their systems and made the payment and started to work on cybersecurity, it's going to take them a while to be fully protected against a similar type of attack. So um, it might not be just one payment. It might be, you know, uh, one or more payments that you, you might have to consider over a given period of time. How are we doing on responses, David? Responses are have leveled out um, all across the board. We've got the answers. So... Uh... I think people will find this one interesting. I'm going to close it here in three seconds. Two seconds, one. Closing the poll now, and I will share the results. Yeah, it's pretty pretty, pretty evenly good. split. Really? I don't know the answer well, myself. I've forgotten the answer. What's the answer, Dave? <laughs> I will bring up the answer for you now. 111000 A lot of money. It is a lot of money. Uh, I know I wouldn't want to stroke that check or, uh, you know, send that, you know, what is that, uh, two Bitcoin nowadays? Yeah. Well, it depends on what it's, yeah, what it's trading now, right? I think today it's probably two and a half. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so ransomware is not cheap. Um, and that's that's just the ransom payment that doesn't include all the hours of your people trying to operate without access to their data. You know, maybe your systems are shut down. You can't process uh, payments. You can't deliver client services. Uh, you can't work on any cases. Um, you know, Cornerstone, if, 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 you know, you have to engage somebody like Cornerstone or an incident response uh, partner, there's costs associated with that. So th this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to, to ransomware. Right. There we go. I'm trying to figure this cursor out. Um, so when we say managed threat protection, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and so I think it's important to think about how do you how do you manage against cyber threats before a breach happens? That's the predict and prevent side of the of uh, the, the paradigm, the identify and protect according to uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework. But then, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's no 100% guarantee that you're not going to get breached. Um, and, and, you know, the, the tendency is for, or, or the expectation that you should be operating under is that you are going to get breached. So you need to have a post-breach plan of attack, and that's where detect and respond comes in. Um, and so this matches up, this, this, uh, this matrix matches up against the, the cyber attack uh, kill chain on the bottom. And so you see that a, a cyber criminal's doing a reconnaissance. Once they understand the network, they start delivering the, the weapon 
and whatever technology they're going to use to facilitate the attack. And then they issue the exploit. That's the breach. Um, and then they start communicating with command and control servers and exfiltrating uh, data or encrypting systems. And so our job, Cornerstone IT's job, is to implement technologies along this cyber kill chain to stop the attack wherever possible. Um, if you just have antivirus and you just have a firewall, that's the only place that you can possibly stop an attack. If you're doing vulnerability scans, you can identify potential holes in your network ahead of time. Um, if you have a SOC doing threat hunting, looking for patterns in the MITRE attack framework, they can stop, potentially stop an attacker before they uh, deliver the exploit. Um, if it is successful and you don't have detect and respond capabilities, you don't know how long they're going to be in their network. Um, and so they could they can affect more than one system. They could potentially shut down your entire network. That's what we're trying to stop. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to trying to do with Cornerstone is to to implement as many layers of technology in a single managed threat protection platform to, to make sure that we stop the breach wherever possible on that kill chain. All right, David, one more and final question. Ooh, here's a good one. So you think about a successful cyber breach, where does it start? Does it start by somebody finding a hole in your firewall, by logging into a server? Uh, does it start at, a, at, a, at an endpoint, you know, laptop or desktop? You know, where does the where does the largest percent or what percentage of successful cyber breaches are starting at the laptop or desktop, as opposed to somewhere else in the network? And remember, this poll question assumes that you already have a firewall, you already have endpoint protection, like you said, um, on the endpoints. You already have email uh, security. You already have DNS security, so it assumes all of those things are in place. So where, what percentage of successful cyber breaches start at that laptop or desktop, assuming all those other layers are, are already in place? All right, give everybody about 10 more seconds to complete this poll. Don't think we'll be too surprised by these results. In five, four, three, two and one all right here come the results you got it 55 percent of you got it 70 percent of cyber cyber breaches start successful cyber breaches start at the laptop or desktop and so that's why cornerstone has endpoint protection that's why they've got uh employee awareness training that's why they're managing the the firewall that's why they have email security in place um, if all of that wasn't in place, then this number would be even higher. But um, given all those layers of protection, you still have a high percentage of, of attacks starting at the laptop or desktop. And so, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, like you have some yeah I'm going to tell, tell you a story. So I think you, the the I think the next slide is the actual no the actual answer, which I guess you like we're saying is seventy percent. So one, I'll tell you a real life uh, story. So a client, well, the narrow client, but we got a call from a, a firm, you go 70%, uh, an East Coast firm, I won't tell you the name or the exact city, but an East Coast firm gave us a call and said, hey, the FBI were just was just in our office and showed us that um, nine terabytes of our data is for sale by some Eastern European hacker that's pretty, was fairly well known to the FBI. They called us and um, we came in and we did uh, some vulnerability scanning. We went through our security best practices, changed all the passwords on the network, made sure that there was no service account that you could log in with, um, turned on some logging, uh, looked at firewall, make sure there wasn't any, any um, open ports that were unnecessary, changed passwords on routers, switches, et cetera. So we did uh, security best practices, but we didn't know where the, the hacker was. We brought in NetSurian's event tracker, turned on all their logging, and we found that there was a PC in the San Francisco, one, one of the remote offices in the West Coast, um, 
that had gotten infected. So whether that someone clicked on a, on a, some malicious um, website, um, they got onto that that PC in the regional office, installed uh, a uh, land scanning software. I think it was the Angry IP Scanner was the product. Um, snooped around the network, got themselves on a server in their data center on the East Coast, and we found where they were uploading the data from. Um, and the the only way we found it was because we turned on logging, fed it through uh, NetSurian's Event Tracker product. The Event Tracker said, "Hey, there's an there's a program running that's not it's not Word, Excel, or PowerPoint running on a PC in this regional office." And we found where it was as a result of the SIM at the event logging that that uh, NetSurian provided. So that's a real life story. They're, they're still a client today, four years later, um, and uh, uh, that was uh, that had a happy ending, um, and uh, and that was the result of being able to use a tool like a, a venture to find where that uh, where that breach was. So that's really kind of the answer to the question: How do you know someone's on your? If you're not tracking your events and what executables are running on your network that's that's safe or not safe, then you don't know if someone you know, and that's how we found that. Well, here's here's another story. Thank, thanks for yeah. You know, where we where we did what we're supposed to do, <laughs> as opposed to the other kind where maybe something still passes. Uh, yeah, this is a story from another legal firm. Um, our SOC caught or observed that a Microsoft Word document <clears throat> was submitted on a web form. I got an attachment. Web form at this firm's office, and once that server, somehow there was a macro inside of that Microsoft Word document that started running and started communicating out to a command and control server that then initiated download of some additional malware, um, and it was actually a program that the North Koreans government uh, was known to use. Um, and so you think about how these endpoint breaches occur, you know, users are the ones that are opening email attachments, they're downloading documents, they're, they're looking at um, reference material that, that clients are sending them, or it could be the HR department that's opening up resumes. Um, you know, if, you're, if your endpoint security is not catching that, or flagging that file as having uh, a malware embedded in it, then it's going to get right past it. You know, there's another there's another story where, where um, you know, there, I don't know. There's there's probably over a hundred different types of endpoint protection out there, different brands. Um, I used to work for Symantec, and um, everybody's good at some things. They're not good at everything. Uh, so one of the things that we do, in addition to what um, Cornerstone uses ESET. Um, whenever we see a new program land on a machine, we're going to scan that file against 70 other antivirus engines. So, by leveraging Event Tracker at that endpoint, it's like they've got 70 uh, antivirus solutions installed in that endpoint. Um, and really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop these things as soon as they, they hit the network as opposed to waiting until they, they get to the core part of the network. All right, um, David, I'm trying to move forward. All right, um, so we've talked about a, a couple of different pieces of the network. Um, and as you think about the cybersecurity maturity model and you think about what it means to have a managed threat protection platform, not point-based technologies, but a platform that consolidates everything. You know, at the end of the day, you want to protect as much of your attack surface as possible. And it's not just the endpoint. It's not just your firewall. Um, those are pieces of your attack surface, but it's the servers, uh, it's any cloud infrastructure, so applications or, or virtual machines that you have running in AWS or Azure or in a private cloud. Uh, it could be the SaaS applications that you use, whether it's you know Microsoft 365 or Salesforce. Um, but 
and today you also have people working from home. And so they're not, you know, they may be using a corporate asset, but they're not necessarily connecting to the corporate network. And so how do you, how do you make sure that each one of those pieces of your tax service is protected? Well, that's part of the net sharing approach is we want to provide solutions that cover each one of these areas. Um, it's up to, to you to deploy those pieces, deploy event tracker on those pieces. Uh, and as you, you know, do your risk scoring about what information is, is available in each one of those areas, but just know that uh, the opportunity is there to protect the entire attack surface, um, leveraging the NetSurian Event Tracker Managed Threat Protection Platform. So, we, do, we, we mentioned the SOC. Um, and before I jump to this slide, let me go back to this slide. So if you think about this, this uh, entire threat surface, uh, I think a, a question that might have popped up in somebody's mind is, what does a SIM actually do? And Jim, you mentioned it, but we collect log data from as many pieces of the network as possible. And if you think about the, the each one of those pieces of infrastructure is sending logs in their own language. Windows sends logs in one format. Cisco firewalls send logs in another format. AWS and Azure send logs in a different format. Microsoft 365, Linux servers, you name it, right? All these various technologies talk in different languages. So the SIM is actually functioning like a universal translator, kind of like the Rosetta Stone, right? And so it, it receives all that information in the various languages, and then it uh, optimizes that into a, what's called a common indexing model, uh, a single universal language. And then um, it helps the security analysts and uh, the machine learning and the, and the artificial intelligence to be able to interpret all those disparate uh, sources of information from a single perspective. Um, so, and then that information is fed into the SOC and the SOC is kind of like air traffic control, right? It's, it's watching over the entire network um, and being able to, to provide information and intelligence that the, you know, a single pilot, you know, a, a sysadmin work responsible for desktops or a network admin responsible for the network, they've got a limited perspective. The pilot can only see what he can see out his window, but air traffic control can see everything. And so that's what the, the SOC's job is. And when most people think about a SOC, they think about a, a bunch of people in a dark room staring at a bunch of screens. And that's part of it. You know, monitoring the, the infrastructure um, watching alerts in real time is part of it, um, but the NetSurian SOC is more than that. So we also have a compliance team. Most of our customers are subject to some sort of compliance, whether it's, you know, um, GDPR or HIPAA or PCI or NIST or GLBA or SOX, you name it. Um, so you need to have a team of people that understand security and events in context of compliance regulations as well. So our solutions always include compliance reporting. Um, the, the version of Event Tracker that Cornerstone is leveraging has more than 26 compliance frameworks available. So you can, you can have your security events uh, formatted in the compliance framework that you're subject to so that all you have to do is hand that off to your auditor um, and you're good to go. Uh, we also have the technology team. So those are the teams that understand how various uh, pieces and parts of the network operate. The network infrastructure, the server infrastructure, the workstations, uh, cloud infrastructure, et cetera. Um, then we have an intelligence team. They're responsible for understanding all the threat data, the intelligence databases that we subscribe to. Um, they map that threat data with the compliance information teams, uh, information and the tech teams data to be able to create all the alerts and reports. Uh, so they're the ones that help uh, pull the needles out of the haystack, so to speak. Um, and then we have a platform team that's responsible for maintaining the SIM software itself, the development, the architecture, and the performance of that SIM platform on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, a SOC is more than just the monitoring team, the people that are staring at the screens. Yeah, I mean, the, the work that your intelligence team does to be able to know what's real and what's not and to stay on top of the 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 vulnerabilities it's uh it's a herculean task and uh one that um is is very hard to master so it's it's 
it we're grateful that Mitsurian has that type of expertise because it's just it's it's such a challenge to for anyone to take on them, themselves. Um, well, all right, good. You guys had to build that yourself, right? How many people would you have to hire? How yeah, long would it take uh, you to get them spun up? Uh, impossible, impossible to do. Um, Dave, I, I haven't been monitoring the chats or the questions. Do you have any questions that came in that we should uh, um, we should address? So we have had a, a couple questions come in. Um, I will uh, I'll ask those out, and then as um, if anybody has any other ones, please enter them in the questions tab, and I'll keep a chat about our a look on that and see. Um, but the first one um, is asking about how their internal IT staff would um, interact with the SOC. Yeah, I, mean, I can answer that, and Guy could get into more detail. I mean, they're going to get an email from Cornerstone or directly from Nitsurian that says, hey, event um, uh, PCXYZ has, um, uh, we found that there's an executable running on that PC IP scanner. Um, uh, and so Cornerstone's going to, if Cornerstone receives that, we'll, co we'll contact the IT director or whoever we're working with. Uh, and say, hey, you got a machine so and so who's got a PC that's uh, that's running uh, an IP scanner on it. Um, uh, whose machine is that? Is that the IT director's machine? Is it an IT staff, or is it an end user who happened to get some some malware on it? So it's usually there is uh, chat, there is phone calls, there's emails. Um, there's uh, those are different. The, the different methods of communication is either um, chat like through Teams or uh, used to be Skype, um, phone call, email, and uh, and that's a typical type of communication. Hey, what's this executable doing on this device? Okay. Yeah, and I'll just chime in. Um, Naturian, our SOC works with Cornerstone. I mean, we're, we're hand in glove with Cornerstone. We work side by side on a daily basis, and so, um, you know, we understand the the security information and the and the, the event data that's going on. They understand the customer's network, um, and so it's usually fastest. It's most efficient for us to communicate with Cornerstone. We provide remediation recommendations, and then they go and figure out how to get that done with the customer. Thanks, guy. And I think this next one kind of ties into it. They said, in the case of a cyber attack. Um, am I informed in real time and notified of steps? Can you help them understand the communication process? Sure, I'll I'll uh, I'll talk about what Naturian's SLAs are, and then Jim can talk about how that gets uh, affected at the customer site. But um, the the event tracker platform is monitoring two types or two major categories of alerts. There's a priority one alert, which is what we consider something that's worthy of waking somebody up in the middle of the night hey we need to do something about this now um, and then there's priority two alerts um, so both of those alerts are uh, identified in real time the priority two alerts are generally things that can be reviewed on a daily basis or a weekly basis there's there's not a, a level of criticality to it but for priority one alerts um, we're sending um, well, the, the event is created in the dashboard real time, and then our SOC is vetting that, validating that, and then forwarding the alert as along with remediation recommendations to the Cornerstone team within 15 minutes. Um, and then, you know, we always follow that up with a phone call uh, to the Cornerstone team as well, just to make sure that they saw the, saw the, uh, the email, the alert. And then from there, Jim's team takes it over. Yeah, similar SLAs. If it's uh, if it's priority one, they're getting called real time within 15 minutes. Um, we're waking people up if we need to. Uh, if it's something that we could remediate ourselves, um, uh, we'll try and do that. If it's after hours, if it's during the day, then usually we'll we'll contact the IT staff. Um, and then if it can be scheduled, we'll do it after hours uh, as uh, as soon as possible. That's great. Thank you both for that information. Um, another one came in. Um, can you give me some idea on the implementation for the co-managed SIM steps involved and time frame? Yeah, I can handle that. Um, so it's uh, the, the onboarding process is um, essentially getting an inventory of the devices on your on your network. So whether that's 
firewalls, routers, switches, net scalers, uh, servers, desktops, getting that inventory, uh, turning on the logging, gathering those logs in a location. So some devices are, are Windows devices that it's a, um, it, collecting those logs is one method. If it's a infrastructure, collecting those logs and aggregating it is, is another method. Um, usually that's a, uh, it's a one to two month process of gathering that information because there's plenty of times where you have to do some extra work to configure that endpoint to enable the loggings. You'd be surprised how small the logs are by default on a Cisco firewall. Turning that on full logging, verbose and, and gathering, making it a larger size. So that's typically the process. Inventory, turning on logging, aggregating it, installing the Nitsurian, um uh, agents and getting that uh, set up. It's probably about a, a one to two month process. And from our perspective, once we start gathering log data, uh, once we start receiving it, we're going to go through about a week of learning. So the, the system learns the normal patterns of behavior. It does a scan of the of the software that's resident and all, this, all the machines. Uh, so we establish a baseline. And then once that baseline has been established and confirmed, then we start generating alerts um, off of that. And so deviations of, of normal behavior, new software that gets installed, um, you know, machines that are talking to other machines in an unusual manner, uh, we're, we're watching all of that. So, um, you know, we, we really rely upon Cornerstone to do the, the heavy lifting of the implementation. And then once our team starts getting the data, um, it's, it's, you know, we're off and running within about a week. Good question, though. Good question. Excellent. All right. Um, and this final question I'm going to answer, how can I get in touch if I have more questions or want some more information? Just check out your screen right now. We have both Jim and Guy's email addresses on there as well as a phone number you can call. Thanks, everybody, so much for attending today. Guy, Jim, thank you so much for all the information you shared. Very enlightening. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.